Well, my name is Ami Jean Bedwell, and uh, I have uh, been at Vista for, well, the whole time, since it's before it began, in the prayer meetings that we were having. And we were so excited about it when we heard about Vista beginning. So we uh, wanted to be a part of it. I didn't know those people before, and I got to know them. What has stayed the same? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, I've made lots of friends from the very beginning, and I still have those friends. I don't know, it's a, it's a big church, but yet it feels small to me. I've always been in the con group, but uh, after Bob passed away, I didn't go to a con group for a while. And then whenever he, uh, when he passed away, I uh, wanted to get back into a con group. And uh, so the uh, Zornemans were starting up. And uh, it's just so neat to have it because that's where you get the, have the, your core friends, your group of friends that you hang with usually is in the comp group. Well, I tell you, one of the couples in the comp group have uh, every week have gone and got groceries for me. And uh, they, she calls me and wants to know if, uh, if I need anything. That was a real, real blessing for them to do that for me. Yeah. And I've just had a lot of people to come and leave things here at the house. Like Sarah came one day and brought a loaf of bread and, uh, and dropped it, just put it right there on my window ledge. Yeah. And then another day, well, this past week, uh, Sarah, another Sarah, uh, brought cinnamon rolls and put them in this chair here, sitting here. And I, and I came home, there they were. It's just, it's just really neat to be able to have friends like that. And some of the people I don't know very well. And for what reason, I don't know, but I think that we just need, we need to make the best of it. Good morning, Vista family. Uh, once again, we are really grateful that you've chosen to tune in and to worship with us today. Um, want to remind you if you're new to the Vista uh, or if you'd like some, uh, some help maybe taking a next step, finding a place to connect and get involved, uh, or if we can answer any questions for you, we do have a digital connect card. Uh, the number that is on the screen, if you'll just text that number, uh, we'll make sure one of our staff reaches out to you uh, and helps answer any questions you might have about the church. Um, again, thank you for, for tuning in. I want to say Happy Mother's Day as well today to all of our moms. Um, we're grateful for you. We appreciate what you do in our lives. I know we have moms in our church, uh, many that have been working overtime at their jobs during all of this, having to put in extra hours. Others have been working overtime at home. And uh, for all that you do, just know that you are loved and we are grateful for all that you do. Hope you have a wonderful Mother's Day. Uh, also along those lines, I wanted to just remind you for our moms and our dads uh, that our kids ministry and our student ministry are hard at work each and every week putting out a lot of content for you. If you're looking for ways to encourage your kids spiritually, uh, our kids and student ministries are doing a great job with that content. Our kids ministry, uh, for example, they host kids worship nights that you can tune into. Uh, they provide creative um, activities and lessons for your kids to participate in. And so hopefully you'll check that out. Uh, and then our student ministry, every Wednesday, they host something called Vista Students Live. It is a lot of fun. In fact, uh, just this last Wednesday, Austin and I joined them and, and played this game uh, called The Impossible Shot, where you basically shoot a Nerf dart at a target. Uh, yes, Austin beat me. I lost the Impossible Shot Challenge, which basically just shows us that Austin is better at playing with kids' toys than I am. I'm not sure what he does in his spare time, but that's a discussion for another day. They have a lot of fun. They discuss current events from uh, what's going on in our world, coronavirus and murder hornets and anything else that pops up. Uh, and then of course they connect all things to a relationship with God and really challenge your students to walk in that. And so uh, again, if you have a, a teenager uh, anywhere from sixth grade through 12th grade, uh, join them for Vista Students Live. But there's a lot of content 
that our, our ministries are putting out and we'd love to have you uh, tune in uh, for all of those things, all right? Again, thanks for being a part today. We're excited about worship. We're hoping uh, pretty soon that things will begin to open back up and we can once again be together. But for now, we're going to worship right where we are. And so I'm gonna pray for us and then Jordan and the band are going to lead us uh, this morning. Let's pray together. Uh, Father, once again, we come before you and we just confess and say that we love you. God, we're grateful for your work in our lives. We're grateful for um, all that you do. So many things, God, that we just take for granted all of the time. Your grace, your mercy, your love, your forgiveness. And so today we just say thank you for it all. We pray that you would um, speak to our hearts today. God, that you might challenge us today in some new and fresh ways. God, that you might refresh us and revive us in some new and fresh ways. And do the work, God, in us that only you can do. And we pray that you would do that. Meet us where we are. In Jesus' name. My eyes are fixed on you, not what I face, not what may stand before me. I know you'll lead me through the desert place, the storms that rage around me. Savior, Redeemer, Defender, and Healer, every single step of the way, you never your name every breath i take i will praise you from the valley to the mountains i i will lift my hands i'm not holding back i will praise you from the valley to the mountain top from the valley to the mountain top Your promise never fails Though silence falls Though darkness tries to hide it Your faithfulness prevails When chaos calls Your peace is all around me Savior, Redeemer, Defender and Healer Every single step of the way valley to the mountain top I will lift my hands I'm not holding back I will praise you from the valley to the mountain I will build an altar from the ashes I will shine your light into the shadows I will raise a banner in the battle lift you high Desperation 
Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You've been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathe your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the night. Deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. Yes, you did. You have been so, so kind. Mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me
creation There at the start before the beginning of time With no point of reference You spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life As you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born in the vapor of your breath. The planets born. If the stars were made to worship, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you made Every burning star, a signal fire of grace If creation sings your praises, so will I promise you don't speak in vain no syllable empty oh boy for once you have spoken on nature and science follow the sound of your voice and as you speak a hundred billion creatures catch your breath Evolving in pursuit of what you said If it all reveals your nature, so will I I can see your heart in everything you say Every painted sky, a canvas of your grace If creation still obeys you, so will I So So will I If the mountains bow in reverence So will I If the oceans roar your greatness So will I For if everything exists to lift you high So will I If the wind goes where you send it, so will I If the rocks cry out in silence, so will I If the sum of all our praises still falls shy
But as you speak A hundred billion failures disappear Where you lost your life So I could find it here If you left the grave behind you So will I I can see your heart in everything you've done Every part designed in a work of art called love If you gladly chose surrender so See your heart a billion different ways Every precious one, a child you died to save If you gave your life to love them, so will I Like you would again a hundred billion times but what magic could amount to your design? You're the one who never leaves the one behind. Jesus, we are so in awe of your greatness of your goodness that even in our sin and in our mess and in our brokenness you chose to give your life up for us and we are so so grateful and so we give you worship and honor and glory and we thank you that during this time throughout this pandemic and um, through everything that we're facing. Maybe some people are facing some really severe anxiety in this time. Maybe people are facing fear or anger in this time. We know that you're close. You're right there. And we can lean on you and we can trust in you. We don't have to put our trust in what's happening around us. We can put our trust in you. You've always been good and you've always been faithful. And we thank you for that. Give you glory and honor and praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. Um, go ahead and comment, give us a like, let us know you're here, say hey to a couple people in the stream, and then Austin's got a great word for you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us online for worship here today at the Vista. If we haven't met before, my name is Austin. I get to serve here as one of our lead pastors. And before we jump in uh, to the sermon today, I wanted to give you a quick update on our kind of plan going forward. Really just reiterating what we mentioned last week. That starting on May 18th, so that's about a week from today, uh, we are comfortable with our small groups considering if they would like to start meeting together again. Now, we're not expecting our small groups to meet. We're not saying you have to meet, that you should meet. Uh, everybody's situation is just really so different that we're just going to trust our small group leaders to talk to their group, to pray through what they think is best for their group, and then make the best decision for their groups. And so that's starting on May 18th, a week from today. And then, uh, again, if there's no spike in cases and things continue to go well during the reopening, phasing, 
probably starting in June, so maybe June 7th or June 14th, we will start gathering again here for worship at the building. Uh, but we will do so in much smaller numbers. We'll probably cap it at around 300 people. And so we will be spread across a number of different services so that we can make sure we respect the social distancing guidelines. And we're going to need your help with kind of figuring out when those services need to be. And so John will have an update for you at the very end of the service. And so make sure that you stay tuned in for that. But then again, like most importantly, the thing we, we want to communicate is that it is so important that we be patient and understanding and kind during this really strange season. I mean, we look around right now and everybody is pointing fingers and blaming and you're being too reckless and you're being too conservative and you should do this and you should do that. And we have this really cool opportunity as the church to just not play the blame game that everybody else is playing. And so while the world's busy pointing fingers and everyone getting mad at each other, we have this unique opportunity to show the world that there is a different way possible. That through the power of the Spirit, uh, by Jesus' own power, we are capable of showing the world a community where we are patient with each other, kind and understanding. So church, let's make sure that we take the opportunity to do that. All right, now jumping in for today, we have reached the halfway point in our series called Beautiful terrible world, a series where we are walking through what I think is the most interesting book in all of scripture, the book of Job. Now, as a reminder, we are walking through, we are reading through the book as a church family, as a part of our pause and pray challenge. And so if you haven't done that, I, I promise it'll be really helpful for you. And so you can go onto our Vista app, download it, it'll make it really easy. Or you can do that on our website. And we read through all 42 chapters of Job over the course of this series so that you get the full Job experience, not just the Sunday Job experience. And so as we jump in today, I would like to start things off a little bit differently. We're going to start things off today with a, uh, an old Chinese proverb. I've never started a sermon with a, a Chinese proverb. So here it goes. Gather around for the proverb called Sai Wang lost his horse. Now a farmer and his son had a beloved horse who helped them earn a living. But one day the horse ran away and their neighbors exclaimed, your horse ran away, what? terrible luck and the farmer said well you know maybe so maybe not we'll see a few days later the horse returned home leading a number of wild stallions back to the farm as well and the neighbors shouted oh your horse has returned and brought all these other horses with him what wonderful luck the farmer replied well you know maybe so maybe not we'll see later that week the farmer's son was trying to break one of the wild horses and she threw him to the ground breaking his leg and the neighbors cried out oh no your son broke his leg what terrible luck the farmer responded ah, maybe so maybe not we'll see a few weeks later soldiers from the national army marched through the town recruiting all the boys for the army but they did not take the farmer's son because he had a broken leg and the neighbors shouted your boy is spared what tremendous luck and the farmer responded maybe so maybe not I guess we'll see. So let's keep, this, let's keep this proverb in mind as we jump back into the story of Job. So by way of a very brief recap, Job was a blameless man living a blessed life on this bizarre bet in the heavens between God and Satan reduced his life to ashes. He lost everything. And Job's initial response to this is, is kind of this just apparently perfect piety. But eventually Job gets angry and he loses his religion. You remember that R.E.M. song? It's a great one. He loses his religion and he starts demanding an explanation from God. And so his friends start trying to offer him all these different explanations for his suffering. And their explanations are all basically temporal retribution. And as we mentioned last week, temporal retribution is just a fancy way to say that in this life, right, temporal, God gives people what they deserve retribution so God gives good people good things God gives bad people bad things and last week we also learned that basically all of us believe this even though it's clearly false right? we basically all believe God gives people what they deserve in this life even though it's clearly not true I mean just look around you it's clearly not true in scripture and yet we believe it on a deep level God does not however run the world in such a way that basically everybody gets what they basically deserve and even though this could not be any clearer, our desire for clean, clear, simple explanations 
pushes us to believe many things about God and God's ways in the world that simply are not true. And so at this point in our story, you know, we are ready for God to finally show up and speak for God's self. God has been listening to Job speak at him. God's been listening to Job's friends allegedly speak for him. And just when we think we are finally going to get our our divine ruling on Job's case, we are interrupted by one last attempt at an explanation. So we'll pick the story up here. Job 32, verses 1 through 12. Grab your Bibles if you have them. If not, it will be on the screen. I believe right here is where I'm told. Job 32, 1 through 12. Then these three men, Bildad, Zophar, and Eliphaz, they ceased answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. But the anger of Elihu, the son of Barachel, the Buzite of the family of Ram, burned. Against Job, his anger burned because he justified himself before God. And his anger burned against his three friends because they had found no answer and yet they condemned Job. Now Elihu had waited to speak to Job because they were all years older than he. And when Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, his anger burned. So Elihu, the son of Barchel the Buzite, spoke out and he said, Now I am young in in years and you are old. It's always a great way to start. You're all much older than me. Therefore I was shy and I was afraid to tell you what I think. I thought age should speak and increased years should teach wisdom but it's a spirit in man and the breath of the almighty gives them understanding the abundant in years may not be wise nor may elders understand justice so i say hey listen to me and i'll tell you what i think behold i waited for your words i listened to your reasonings while you pondered what to say i even paid close attention to you indeed there was no one who refuted Job, not one of you answered his words. Okay, it's Job 32, 1 through 12. So here in chapter 32, we are interrupted, interrupted, introduced to a new character, a young man named Elihu, who's been sitting by patiently listening to Job and his friends argue back and forth. And Elihu is not very happy with what he has heard. Uh, And so he finally speaks up, And when he does, we very quickly learn a couple of things about him. Namely, he is arrogant and he's angry. Always a great combination. So let's start with the arrogant. Elihu says that he has waited to speak out of deference to his elders. But now that he's, he's listened to them, he's realized they really don't know what they're talking about. And so he needs to pipe up and set them straight, right? Which is spoken just like a young man. And notice that he even goes so far as to say that he is filled with divine understanding and as such he is completely objective. He even says, I don't know if you caught it, he says, look, I'm so objective that I don't even know how to flatter. I I don't even have it in me to flatter. I'm not capable of flattering people. That's how objective I am. And uh, you know, we've probably all been tempted to believe at some point that we're completely objective that we have this God's eye view on reality and so uh, I put together this very helpful little uh, decision tree that will help you discern whether or not you are in fact objective and thus have a God's eye view on reality it's very simple here's how it works so uh, you've got this first question here which is are you God the answer to that's probably going to be no and then from there you just go down no and no you're not objective right we're going to be selling these on uh, the website I think they go great on an office, uh, in a wallet when you get in an argument with your husband or your wife. Anyways, there's that. And uh, so he's young, and his, his parents let him win too much growing up. You've been around that kid. And he's arrogant, and he just doesn't know what he doesn't know. And I'm going to quit picking on him now because we've probably all been him at some point. I know I have. And so let's just observe that we should all be very wary of people who swagger around confidently claiming to objectively speak for the big guy. And that brings us to our second observation about Elihu. He's angry. In fact, I don't know if you you noticed, but we are told four times in the first five verses that Elihu is angry. And what's he so angry about? You know, has he got that like that quarantine rage that some of us have right now? It's a lot of pent up energy. He just needs to find somebody to be mad at. Well, on one level, it's pretty obvious why he's angry. You know, he's angry at Job for daring to question God. He's angry at Job's friends because they failed to put Job in his place. But his anger also seems to be coming from a deeper place. 
right? A place that speaks to our profound desire for explanations. Our desire to be able to make all the suffering make sense. And we'll come back to that. But for now, let's dive in and listen to Elihu's explanation and see if it's really any different than the faulty explanations we have heard thus far. So Job 36, we're going to read verses 1 through 11 now. Job 36, 1 through 11. Then Elihu continued and he said, hey, wait for me a little and I will show you there is yet more to be said in God's behalf. I will fetch my knowledge from afar and I will ascribe righteousness to my maker for truly my words are not false. One who is perfect in knowledge is with you. He's really feeling himself right now. Now behold, God is mighty but does not despise any. He's mighty in strength of understanding. He does not keep the wicked alive but he gives justice to the afflicted. He does not withdraw his eyes from the righteous but with kings on the throne he has seated them forever and they are exalted. If they are bound in fetters and are caught in cords of affliction then he declares to them their work and their transgressions that they have magnified themselves. He opens their ear to instruction and commands that they return from evil and if they hear him and serve him they will end their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures right, job 36 verses 1 through 11 there so elihu he is young he is arrogant he is angry but he is also very very smart and notice the clever little explanation clever little twist he adds to his explanation here and Job 36, now like everybody else, he assumes that God has ruined Job's life, even though we know it's not in fact God who ruined Job's life. And like everybody else, he assumes that Job deserves it, but notice that instead of arguing that God is punishing Job because of Job's wickedness, Elihu argues that God is disciplining Job for Job's own good. And I'll say that again. Instead of arguing that God is punishing Job because of Job's wickedness, he tweaks it a little bit. He says, no, 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 God is disciplining Job for Job's own good. So Elihu says, yeah, you know, God is afflicting Job, but that affliction should be seen as, you know, loving parental discipline. Is God teaching Job a perhaps painful, but in the long run, a very merciful lesson? You know, it's like when you're, your kid, if your kid's gonna run out to the freeway, run out to I-35 chasing a ball, you don't go, hey, honey, you know, could we talk about this? Could we, could we Daniel Tiger this thing and you tell me what kind of emotions you're feeling that's leading you to want to run out into the freeway? Is that what you do when your kids run out of the freeway? Of course not. You run out there, you grab him by the britches, you yank him out of the freeway, you discipline him, and the Daniel Tiger stuff can wait for later because you don't want your kid to get hit by a car. Eh, that's the basic idea. We all understand it. And the first thing to say about Elihu's explanation here is that it's very, very biblical. In fact, that exact thing is said almost verbatim in a place like Hebrews 12, five through six, right? Listen to Hebrews 12, five through six. It says, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you're reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and he scourges every son whom he receives, right? And so there it is, right? Uh, God disciplines us for our good. That's what Hebrews 12 said. And so God must be disciplining Job for Job's good Case closed. Or is it? Because remember what we said last week about scripture? That the Bible is not a single book written by a single author that communicates a single divine message about every single topic. Now rather the Bible is a collection of books that are in a conversation with one another and the truthfulness of scripture comes out as we listen to that conversation. It's very important to remember when you read the Bible because is God disciplining Job? Well, no. We are literally told in the very first verse of the book that Job is blameless. Now, is God trying to teach Job a lesson? Well, no. We are explicitly told two different times by God himself that Job is blameless. Right, and so let's just say this as clearly and straightforwardly as possible so we can't miss it. God is not punishing Job. God is not disciplining Job. And God is not trying to teach Job a lesson because Job is, say it with me, all across Bell County, blameless. 
And so the mistake that everybody in this story keeps making is they're looking for a single, simple explanation that can make all of Job's suffering make sense. And I think we can all understand that. You know, that, that, that deep desire to be able to make the suffering make sense, to understand why God did it or allowed it or whatever. But what we learn from the story of Job is that sometimes our suffering doesn't make sense. I'll say that one again. Sometimes our suffering just does not make sense. I mean, let's get down to brass tacks here, okay, in Job's story. Why has Job suffered? What does the text literally say? Well, what the text literally says, which is just really bizarre and difficult to understand, is that Job has suffered because he got caught up in the middle of an argument that broke out in a heavenly council meeting, right? That Job has suffered because he was a casualty of a bet between God and Satan. That is what the text literally says. And so if we are to walk away from any, uh, with any particular lesson, right, from this utterly bizarre set of events, surely that lesson has got to be that sometimes our suffering does not make sense. I love the way Anne Lamott puts this. Here's what she says. She says, this is the message of the book of Job. Any snappy explanation of suffering you come up with will be horse, star, 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 star. Horse poop, kids, horse poop. So why do we suffer? You know, why do you suffer? I, I know you, you do. I know you will. Well, gosh, th- there are a billion possible explanations for why we suffer. I mean, it could be divine punishment or it could be redemptive discipline or it could be self-inflicted consequences or it could be the sins of others or it could be nature or Satan or bad sushi or your adorable but tyrannical toddler. You know, it's been that for me a few times. There are a billion possible explanations for why we suffer, which means there's rarely a single simple explanation for it. And yet instead of just accepting that, instead of accepting that often our suffering won't make sense, we try to make it make sense. And that brings us back to our Chinese proverb that we started with. Because I don't know about you, but everywhere I have gone, everywhere I have listened, everywhere I have looked for the past month and a half, I have found myself surrounded by that Chinese farmer's annoying neighbors people trying to explain our current situation you know oh what good luck oh what bad luck oh God's trying to do this oh God's trying to teach us that oh no God's trying to teach us this other thing God's trying to make us slow down or pay more attention to our children or God's trying to make the churches all smaller God's judging America because of this or God's trying to get rid of the handshake blah 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 and the genius of Job's story okay think about this is that it gives us this kind of behind the scenes peek into the true and bizarre explanation for Job's suffering. A bet during a heavenly council meeting, right? That's why Job has suffered. And then it lets us watch as all the characters in the story make complete idiots of themselves as they pompously offer up their explanations. And every single one of them is wrong, right? You've noticed that every single time somebody opens up their mouth in the book of Job and they say, oh, well, here's what God's doing. It's wrong, (coughs) right? Wrong, 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 wrong. Every time somebody opens up their mouth, it is wrong. Which is perhaps a not so subtle way for God to say, hey, just, just pump the brakes on all your explanations. Because if you're a human, and you're trying to explain somebody else's suffering, then you're probably wrong, and you should probably just be quiet. In a recent article about the pandemic in Time Magazine, New Testament scholar N.T. Wright put it like this. He says, no doubt the usual silly suspects will tell us why God is doing this to us. A punishment, a warning, a sign. Now these are knee-jerk would be Christian reactions in a rationalistic culture where everything must have an explanation. But supposing it doesn't, well, it's no part of the Christian vocation then to be able to explain what's happening and why. In fact, it's part of the Christian vocation not to be able to explain. 
and to lament instead. And that brings us back to our, our angry young little friend, Elihu. Now, Elihu, like all of us, he wants to be able to make all the suffering make sense. And so Job's stubborn refusal to accept everybody's explanations is infuriating Elihu because Job won't let him make all the suffering make sense. Job refuses to let him make his suffering make sense. And so notice that when Elihu tries to explain away Job's suffering, he's not really trying to help Job, but he's actually trying to help himself. All right, just listen to what he says in Job 32, verse 20. He says, I must speak so that I may find relief. I must open up my lips and answer so that I may find relief. And I know exactly what Elihu was talking about, and you probably do too. A couple of months ago, this lady made a, an appointment to come and see me here at the office, back when we could do such things. And uh, she came in and she sat down and she proceeded to tell me just one of the saddest stories I'd ever heard. You know, she'd been in an incredibly abusive marriage, a difficult divorce, had recently lost her job, was in a brutal battle for custody of her daughter. And as she's just telling me this story, I'm sitting there processing it and I'm thinking about how I can, how I can help her and how I can fix her situation and, you know, thinking of these different explanations I can offer for what God might be up to in the midst of it all. And so she, she finishes and I just immediately, you know, bam, launch into my explanation and next steps and job leads and here's some counselors you can talk to and some theological observations. And uh, she was so sweet and appreciative. And when I, when I finished with my grand explanation, uh, she goes, thank you so much for all that. It was so much more than I was expecting and, and I'm gonna follow up and I'm gonna follow up on those job leads and I'm gonna contact that counselor you mentioned and I'm gonna think about some of those, those, those observations that you made, I'm gonna do all that. Um, but before I go, would you mind praying for me? because that's, that's what I actually came for, was to receive prayer. And I went, oh, yeah, I mean, of course. I mean, of course I was gonna pray for it. I'm a pastor, it's what I do, you know. So here's this lady, right, reminding me, her pastor, that what she had actually come to me for was my prayer and not my explanations. Along those lines, listen to what Parker Palmer says about our um, well-intentioned but ultimately selfish attempts to explain other people's suffering. Now, here's what he says. One of the hardest things we must do sometimes is to be present to another person's pain without trying to fix it. To simply stand respectfully at the edge of that person's mystery and misery and standing there, we feel useless and powerless, which is exactly how a depressed person feels. And our unconscious need as Job's comforters is to reassure ourselves that we are not like the sad soul before us. In an effort to avoid those feelings, I give advice which sets me, not you, free. Read that last part again. In an effort to avoid those feelings, I give advice which sets me, not you, free. All that to say, it's not wrong to want explanations. It's human. We can't help but want explanations. But it is wrong to fabricate them in a selfish an insecure attempt to convince yourself that you're in control because you have all the explanations. Because you don't have all the explanations. In fact, you know, just, just between me and you, uh, you've got far fewer explanations than you could ever imagine. And so instead of trying to make all the suffering make sense, just accept that it doesn't what Jesus does, right? I'll say that again. Instead of trying to make all the suffering make sense, just accept that it doesn't, but Jesus does. 
And that's kind of abstract. And so what does that look like in the midst of an actual human life? Well, almost uh, four years ago to the day, it's a little bit over four years, uh, two of our dearest friends, King and Kara Young, a lot of you know King and Kara. King plays bass in the band, Kara sings. Um, they tragically lost their son, Everett, in a 32-week miscarriage. Um, and it was just devastating. I still remember when it happened. I still remember the phone call. I remember going up to the hospital and, and holding him and watching them hold him. And it was the saddest thing I've ever been a part of, you know. And in the weeks after, uh, we talked about it. And I remember getting a text message very late at night from Kang. I still have it. And he said, hey, this is something we've really been struggling with. Romans 8, 28 says, God works all things together for the good of those who love him. But how is this good? How is, how is my son's death good? How is watching my wife cry uncontrollably good? And so we talked about it, you know. Um, we talked about how what Romans 8, 28 says is that God takes all things even the most terrible and tragic things, and God bends them toward redemption. And that's what Romans 8, 28 says. God takes all things, even the most terrible and tragic things, and God finds a way to bend those things toward redemption. In other words, God doesn't cause all of our suffering for a purpose, but God can make all of our suffering have a purpose. God didn't cause all of our suffering for a purpose. God doesn't take our children in order to teach us a lesson as if God so devalues the life of our children that he would take them from us in order to teach us a lesson. No, that's not who God is. Rather, God can, however, make all of our suffering have a purpose. And that's exactly what we see in Jesus. In Jesus, we see God taking all of our suffering the deserved and the undeserved, the understandable and the utterly senseless like the death of a child. In Jesus, we see God taking all of it and bending it toward redemption, finding a way to integrate even the saddest notes into the infinite, joyful music of the kingdom of God. And even now, we can hear echoes of it. And we call this the redemptive providence of God. King and Kara now have two children. I think we got a picture we'll throw up here. Uh, a beautiful little three-year-old girl named Evelyn. She's the most adorable girl I've ever seen in my life, except for my little girl. They're in a tie for the cutest little girls on the planet. And a handsome baby boy named Lawson. And when I asked them what gave them the courage to try for another child after having their hearts broken like that, here's what they said. They said we had to get over the idea that we had done something wrong that had caused Jesus to take our son from us. The fact is we live in a fallen world. Awful stuff is going to happen and it's absolutely terrible. But our desire to parent was greater than our fear. We knew God had revealed his character to us that he would never forsake us and so we knew that as long as we had him we could withstand anything, even another death. You see, Christians, Christians are people who have given up trying to explain and understand all the suffering. Because we understand that Jesus has already explained everything we need to know. That it's not all going to be okay we talked about that in the first week of the series it's not all going to be okay but that's okay because God is unconditionally for us bending all things bending every last thing toward the indestructible joy of the kingdom of God let's pray together gracious God the world is a wild place We live with broken hearts. We have suffering in our own lives that we cannot and will never understand and our world is filled with more suffering than we could ever imagine. And so we are grateful that because of Jesus, we don't have to try to understand or fake explain it all. 
We're grateful that we understand the only thing we really need to know, that you are indestructibly for us, that you are for our good, and that you are even now bending all things, even the most terrible and tragic things, toward the infinite joy of the kingdom of God. And that is enough for us to know. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to give ourselves a few moments to respond now. And if you're new to Vista, you maybe tuned in over the last few weeks. What that means is a few moments to slow down, let the Spirit of God get beneath the surface and do the deeper work that God would probably like to do today. There are a number of different ways you can respond. Uh, one of the best ways is just by receiving prayer. You know, maybe something connected with you resonated in your heart today. Maybe you're going, man, I've, I've had this suffering that I've tried to understand for so long. and It's eaten me up. And what I heard God say today is, look, as long as you understand Jesus, as long as you understand that I am unconditionally for you, then you understand everything you really need to know. And it's time to release some of that, that desire for explanations that we just don't get a lot of times in life. Uh, we've got some people who would love to pray with you. You want to talk to somebody about following Jesus and, and what it means. we got a prayer team ready. Uh, there's a number here at the bottom of the screen. You can call that number and someone will be on the other end uh, loving to pray with you or talk to you about next steps. One of the other really good ways that you can respond is by what we call giving and receiving. And so God gave us Jesus. Uh, it's only fitting that we would be generous in return. So we would encourage you to give. And then finally, by receiving, and when I say receiving, I mean receive communion, right? The body of Christ that was broken for you, the blood of Christ that was shed for you, uh, this meal that is a reminder of our past forgiveness and our future redemption, a reminder that God is throwing a party for sinners. Every last one of you has been invited, and there's more than enough to go around. All right, so you can gather your elements. Really, anything will do. Uh, somebody told me they used garlic bread last week, though. It was, it was very not good, so I would caution you against the garlic bread. Almost anything else will do. Vista family, if you are watching and you follow Jesus, then this meal is for you. This is the body of Christ that was broken for you. This is the blood of Christ that was shed for you. And so take, receive, and eat a gift of your maker, free of charge, a physical, tangible reminder of the love of God. set my gaze on you all I can feel is peace when I turn my eyes from you my feet begin to sink I can hear you say will you trust me I'm in control So I'll sing a new song to you Oh, I'll sing a new song Even when I don't see it, I trust you Even when I don't feel it, my hope is in you my life and all my plans my future in your hands surrendered so that you can have your way have your way have your way through the pain and suffering Jesus, you are all I need When I turn to feeble things Keep my heart from wandering I can hear you say Will you trust me? I'm in control 
So I'll sing a new song to you Oh, I'll sing a new song Even when I don't see it, I trust you Even when I don't feel it, my hope is in you My life and all my plans my future in your hands surrendered so that you can have your way have your way have your way so i choose to trust you lord i choose to hear your voice above all the other noise and I'll take another step Cause your plans for me are good And your promise never fails You've been faithful before You'll be faithful again And I choose to trust you, Lord I choose to hear your voice Above all the other noise And I'll take another step Cause your plans for me are good And your promise never fails You've been faithful before You'll be faithful again Yeah Cause you are faithful So even when I don't see it I trust you And even when I don't feel it my hope is in you my life and all my plans my future in your hands surrendered so that you can have your way have your way have your way so i choose to trust I choose to hear your voice above all the other noise And I'll take another step Cause your plans for me are good And your promise never fails You've been faithful before You'll be faithful again Hey Vista, thanks for tuning in for worship with us today. Uh, before you go, I could use your help. So our team is currently working on plans to figure out what it's gonna look like to reopen at some point in June. And it doesn't mean we're just gonna go back to exactly how it was where we all fill this building up and, and do what we used to do back in February, uh, but it's rather gonna mean we're gonna have to change things a little bit. And we have a lot of good plans in place for seating layouts and hygiene practices and some other little logistical things that we can do on our end. But one of the hardest things for us to work through is how are we gonna reduce the number of people in worship from our normal numbers down to about 250 per service. So there's gonna be some kind of registration or ticketing system or something to come. But what it really means is we're gonna to have to do more than three services. And so to figure out what times and days would be best for that, we could use your help trying to gauge your comfort level and starting to come back to church for corporate worship and also figuring out what days and times could be best for your household. So we're asking each household to take just a minute to take a brief survey and let us know some of those things. You can take that survey online at thevista.tv slash survey, or if you have the Vista app, we're about to send you a push notification with a link straight to it. So we really appreciate your help working through this stuff. We're excited to get back together, but we're also uh, want to be really cautious in getting back together in the right way. So thank you for your help. Make sure you tune in with us next week for live stream, download the Vista app and follow us on social. We'll see you next week.